My name is Erica Pierce and I have a laboratory here at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And our lab studies T-cell metabolism and we're interested in how the programs within T-cells affect their fate and function in vivo. So naive T-cells exist in a resting state um, in vivo and um, upon activation they'll proliferate, a ter process termed uh, clonal expansion, and they'll gain effector functions. And these effector functions are important for clearing pathogens and tumors. The conventional view of cellular metabolism is one where non-proliferating cells, such as resting naive T cells, rely on oxidative phosphorylation for energy. However, proliferating cells, such as activated T cells or even cancer cells, engage aerobic glycolysis. While both processes generate ATP, aerobic glycolysis is much less efficient. So this really leaves the question of why a T-cell, when metabolic demands become the greatest, would switch to a less efficient metabolism, at least in terms of ATP production. It's thought that the metabolism of uh, T-cells is really um, adapted to facilitate the incorporation and uptake of nutrients into daughter cells, and really that aerobic glycolysis is important for cellular proliferation, both in terms of energy and biosynthesis. However, it's also true that antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, um, which during a resting state engage oxidative metabolism, they'll become activated in response to mobile, microbial products, and they will engage aerobic glycolysis, but these cells do not proliferate. And this suggested, at least to us, that in certain instances, cellular proliferation isn't necessarily linked to aerobic glycolysis, and that this metabolic pathway may actually be responsible for underlying pathways other than or in addition to proliferation. So what we set out to do in a very simple way was determine whether T cells needed to engage aerobic glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation to support their survival, proliferation, or effector functions. Jihao Chang in our lab, who's the first author of this study, he decided to use a differential culture system to sort of get at these questions. And what he did is um, used glucose, which is the normal substrate for T cells. So T cells that are growing in glucose will engage aerobic glycolysis. But he also differentially cultured T cells in galactose. But T cells that are growing in galactose are enforced to respire, where they can only engage oxidative phosphorylation. Upon activation, the T cells were able to proliferate and survive in the presence of galactose, indicating that oxidative phosphorylation could support these processes in the cell. But he also measured function of these cells. And what he found is that the T cells growing in galactose, even though they were able to proliferate and survive, they had a defect in their effector cytokine production. And they did not make normal levels levels of interferon gamma. Activated T cells engage aerobic glycolysis. This is a process where glucose is metabolized by a series of glycolysis enzymes to pyruvate in the cytoplasm of the cell. Aerobic glycolysis can support both the proliferation and survival of activated T cells. Activated T cells will also uh, gain effector functions. In particular, they'll transcribe and translate interferon gamma messenger RNA, and this will result in the production of interferon gamma protein from the cell. When T cells are unable to engage glycolysis and they're forced to engage oxidative phosphorylation, glycolysis enzymes will no longer be engaged in the glycolysis pathway. One of these enzymes, GAP-DH, has been shown to act as an RNA binding protein where it can actually bind to the 3' UTR of interferon gamma messenger RNA and this binding will prevent the translation of this cytokine leading to the decrease in interferon gamma production from activated T cells that are engaging oxidative phosphorylation. We know that in certain settings, T cell dysfunction goes in hand in hand with increased expression of the inhibitory receptor PD-1. And when we returned to look at the cells that were cultured in galactose, we found that they also had increased PD-1 expression. And this suggested the idea that T cell exhaustion or dysfunction might actually be downstream of metabolic regulation in certain settings. Could this be during chronic infection, where T cells are known to be exhausted or dysfunctional, or perhaps even in a tumor microenvironment? Because tumor cells also adopt aerobic glycolysis and presumably would be using glucose and sugars at a high rate. And if T cells and tumor cells existed in the same place together, would a tumor cell be able to outcompete the ability of a T cell to use glucose? We cold cultured activated T cells with tumor cells. And when we did this, we found that the T cell's ability to produce interferon gamma decreased while PD-1 expression increased when cultured with tumor cells, as opposed to the same number of T cells by themselves. We also found that this decrease in interferon gamma was mediated, at least in part, by the depletion of glucose by the cancer cells, because the addition of glucose back to the cold culture allowed the T cells to produce higher levels of interferon gamma once again. So what our results really show is that aerobic glycolysis is a metabolically regulated signaling mechanism that's needed to control cellular function. And we hope that by understanding the metabolic processes that govern T cell function, we'll be able to create new targets for therapies against human disease.